Kia ora koutou, ngā mihi kia koutou. Thank you for joining us today. Welcome to this webisode of Our Regenerative Future. We'll be unpacking the question of what is regenerative organic. Um, I'm Alina Siegfried. I'm the author of the Our Regenerative Future content series, which is produced in partnership with Pure Advantage and Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And over the past six months or so, I've taken a real deep dive into the world of regenerative agriculture in New Zealand. Um, what started as a remit to write a few articles about uh, farmers that were involved and in doing regenerative things um, on their properties um, has turned into a 15 part series that we published back in April and uh, six webinars so far. And we've had so much dialogue um, and conversation and great momentum around this question of regenerative agriculture and the opportunity for New Zealand that we've launched another six webinars and this is the first of those uh, second series. So welcome, thank you for joining us. We'll be exploring all sorts of regenerative topics, expanding a little bit outside uh, agriculture in this uh, next six, looking at tourism, regenerative forestry, and um, basically how we can build a regenerative economy in general in New Zealand. Um, and the recognition that it's not all on farmers to solve our environmental and climate change woes, it's really going to take all of us working together at systems level um, to put in place strategies to, um, to face a challenging future. So today's webinar, we'll be looking at the interplay between um, the organics market, um, the regenerative agriculture uh, movement, and, and what is this thing of organic uh, regenerative or regenerative organic. Um, so yeah, we'll be looking forward to unpacking that with three great panelists today. Um, we've got uh, Jeff Catch, who is the Chief Impact Officer at Rodale Institute. Uh, very excited to have him on board. Jeff is responsible for expanding Rodale's global influence in the development and execution of the Institute's core strategies and overseeing opportunities for partnership and co-investment. Um, and this is really great to have Jeff on the call because it was, of course, uh, Bob Rodale, the founder of the Institute, who coined the term regenerative agriculture back in the 1970s. So we're super honored to have um, that representation here today. Robin O'Brien has the honor of being called Foods Erin Brockovich by the New York Times. Uh, she's a dual citizen of New Zealand and the US, co-founder of Replant Capital, a leader in the good food movement and advocate for organics and serves on the board of advisors for Organics Aotearoa New Zealand. And finally, we also have Scott Lawson, who's one of New Zealand's largest producers of organic berry fruit. He and his partner, Vicky Meach, have been um, pioneers in their field with their business, True Earth, becoming certified organic more than 25 years ago in 1994. So Scott's on the board of Organic Aotearoa New Zealand as well and chair of the Hawke's Bay Vegetable Growers. Um, thank you for all participating in the poll. Most, uh, most people have now voted. Um, looks like we've got about 46% uh, of you are farmers or growers yourselves. Uh, welcome. And we've got uh, a few people from science, academia, business media. Um, it looks like most people have read either some or, um, or all of the uh, regenerative Future content series, which is great because you've been a bit of a grounding to this conversation. And um, again, most people are reasonably familiar with regenerative agriculture, which is fantastic. Um, so I'm going to uh, give our panelists a chance to introduce themselves in a minute. Um, but before I do, I'd love to invite you to uh, put any questions that you might have for these panelists, either the whole panel or individually in the Q&A box. Um, that's different from the chat box. You'll find it in the bar at the, at the um, uh, in, yeah, below. And uh, please put the questions in there. You can upvote questions. So if you see something that really you want to hear about, um, feel free to give it an upvote and we'll, uh, we'll see what kind of conversation we can spark today. So I think without further ado, I would love to invite our panelists to introduce themselves, pro provide a little bit more context. Um, let's start with you, Jeff. And if you could also include in your answer, what does regenerative organic mean to you? Great, great. Well, what an honor and what a pleasure it is to be here and to represent the work of Rodale Institute to such an illustrious crowd. Um, again, my name is Jeff Catch. I, I serve as one of the leaders of the Rodale Institute. 
Uh, Rodale Institute is widely known as the global leader in regenerative organic agriculture. So as Alina alluded to, our founder, J.I. Rodale, uh, pioneered the organic food and farming movement in North America back in the 1940s. And along came his son, Robert Rodale, her, who coined the term regenerative in the 1970s. Uh, at the heart of who we are, we're a science and a research organization that's trying to uncover the best practices for farmers all over the world and help you um, be empowered with more information to how to transition away from chemical dependent agriculture towards these regenerative and organic practices. So uh, our primary objectives are to do research and then education to equip and empower farmers um, to move in this direction. Thank you, Jeff. Over to you, Robin. Well, I just want to thank everybody for hosting this and for inviting me to participate. Um, it's very close to my heart. I'm named after a farmer in Palmerston North, Robin Tanner, and have so much family in New Zealand that we were so lucky to get to spend Christmas with before COVID hit and everything else. So I just want to thank you guys for that. You know, Replant, we believe that no matter what the metrics are, no matter what the intentions are, if the finances for the farmers don't work, then the system isn't gonna work. So we put the farmer first. And unfortunately, a lot, not a lot of financial institutions did that. And where we really landed was you can't fix a broken food system with a broken financial system. And in order to have a resilient food system, there has to be financial resiliency for the farmer. So to think about regenerative agriculture and organic on a spectrum, and we're not here to dictate where somebody should land on that spectrum. We're here to meet you where you are and, and answer questions and take that feedback and figure out what makes the most sense economically for a farmer that's considering that transition. What we do know from the work that we've done is that there are farmers that will come, come to us and say, you know, as we transition from a really chemically intensive agricultural system to regenerative agriculture, we were able to save half a million dollars over 7,000 acres in the first year. So as we think about that, we think about regenerative as a reduction in chemical inputs, which that's cost savings directly to the farmer, as well as the building out of soil health, which again, there's something incredibly intuitive when you talk about the regeneration of soil that comes, you know, from a deep understanding, which so many farm families have because they've been third or fourth or fifth or sixth generation farm families. So, you know, for us, it's not to dictate. We're not here to, to tell anybody what to do. It's to really sit down with these families and better understand what's the financial model that works for your family that keeps your children on the farm so that there's food security for New Zealand. Thank you, Robin. And Scott, you'd like to introduce yourself. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much to Pure Advantage for, for asking me to join the panel. And thank you for our American friends joining us on late on a Sunday night. So appreciate you digging in. And I know Jeff's on holiday as well. And, and Robin should be having a quiet family time. So thanks for, thanks for taking your time out to join us here in New Zealand, too. So short bio about myself. Um, I've been... Growing, I grew up in the Heratonga Plains here in the, in the horticultural area of Hawke's Bay, New Zealand. And I've spent most of my lifetime here working, living, training, etc. with that. Trained as an engineer, mechanical, and then I've also studied forestry. But my real passion for the last 25 odd years has been the certified organic vegetable growing and berry fruit production as well too. So apologize uh, if I'm not so au fait with the pastoral farming stuff. I'll try and answer some of those questions. But that's my area of expertise is in the vegetables and berry fruit. And I was invited to speak as a member of the OANS board. And um, I have a long history in association with Certified Organics New Zealand as Biogro certified for more than 25 years now. So that's really a short bit about what I'm, I'm interested in. I'm interested in everything natural. Um, and my philosophy is in organics. I particularly uh, like to speak about certified organics and some organics with integrity. Um, we have a problem here in New Zealand where we don't have that integrity and, and register, registration under the word organic. So um, as an industry, we've been pushing for that for a long time. So I'll often refer to certified organics and we're, as I say, we're alluding to this national standard, which we hope to get in place at some stage. Um, <clears throat> I think that the definition of regen is, um, as I guess we refer to uh, Bob Riddell's version of it, is beyond sustainability, it's, it's better, it's, it's continuous improvement. And many of us have fallen into the sustainability trap in the past uh, of just saying it's, it's okay to keep doing what we're doing, it's being sustainable. 
I think we need to regenerate. We need to help others regenerate and grow, grow the book. And as a certified organic producer, I think we've often dropped that ball um, and explaining to people that the philosophies of organics to me are actually regenerating continuous improvement, et cetera, as well. And I don't think we've sold that story very well. And hence now we're ending up in a situation in the organic industry saying, regen organic. Let's, let's add this add on to what we're currently doing because we've done um, a poor job. So that's enough about me, but that's, um, I'm happy to be part of the panelists today. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And yes, certainly this conversation does need to go beyond just pastoral farming into all, all methods of land production and primary industries in New Zealand. Um, and really cool to see also from the chat window that we've got somebody watching from the Philippines. So welcome, Gurley. Amazing to have uh, people from around the world. I'd love to start with a question that actually has come through on the chat window from uh, Jenny Lux, who's with the Soil and Health Association as an organic market gardener. Um, it's an interesting question around how do we unpack this regenerative organic? So she asks, is a regenerative a subset of organic or is it the other way around? And what, what's the interplay here? And maybe I'll invite Jeff, if you could start off that conversation. I'll, I'll certainly start and attempt to answer that question, but I do believe um, that in, in all, in the reality that Robin sort of laid out there, it's a continuum for farmers. We, we need to um, begin to meet farmers wherever they are in that spectrum and help them march down this path towards regenerative organic. Um, at Rodale Institute, many of you may know that we've recently, recently launched a new standard in agriculture called the Regenerative Organic Certification. And if you're interested in reading more about that, you can go to regenorganic.com. ORG. Um, essentially, to Scott's point, you know, at Rodale Institute, we believe that you have to constantly be about continuous improvement. Uh, Robert Rodale um, loathed the word sustainability. He felt that um, as he was traveling around the world and he was often visiting countries where uh, he saw broken agricultural systems, and it was at the time when the word sustainability was coming into vogue, that it was a really poor choice of words because as he saw in his own travels, there were often systems that weren't worth sustaining. They needed to be completely rebuilt. And uh, in agriculture or in any industry, there needs to be that, you know, setting a higher bar. We always are about innovation and about pushing uh, to new heights. And so we've set this standard that really brings together organic as a baseline. Um, Rodale was very in influential in launching the organic standard uh, ultimately that was passed in the year 2000, we began to see the rollout of the National Organic Program. And we, we are absolutely making that the baseline to attaining the regenerative organic certification. We're saying that you at least, you know, must be certified organic. And then this whole regenerative concept takes into to account three pillars. One is soil health, because the current USDA, the, the, the standard that we adhere to in the United States really doesn't have a pillar that, it, that addresses how is a farmer improving the health of their soil. So we've added that in. The second is around animal welfare. There's really nothing in the current organic standard, um, at both at the iPhone level and at the NOP level here in the United States, that's addressing how animals are really being tr treated in the system. And then thirdly, and maybe most importantly, is the human well-being, the human labor piece. Um, many of our uh, brand partners here in the United States were traveling around the world to source products like cotton or palm oil. And they were finding that as they were going to these countries where they were sourcing their own products that were certified organic and meeting that certification, um, they, were, they were finding that there was horrific working conditions where young children were often working long days in the field without the kind of human rights that, uh, that we all want and for our, for our own children. And so the regenerative organic certification really em embraces those three pillars, which are animal welfare, human labor, and soil health. So that's the high bar that we've set. And at the heart of it, it's all about innovation and, and really helping to set an aspirational goal for farmers to attain. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear your uh, thoughts if you've got anything to add on that, Robin, um, given your familiarity with regenerative organic in the US. Yeah, so I think, you know, what we saw happen here in the United States was farmers embraced this chemically intensive agricultural system. Um, and they were, they were misled. 
I don't, there's no there's no other way to put that. They were misled, and in the last couple of years, they have woken up to the fact that their kids don't want to take over their farms. The kids don't want to embrace that chemically intensive agricultural system. Some farmers say like there's sort of an addiction now at this chemically intensive agricultural system. But when you really step back from that, you know, it takes a lot of money to sustain that chemically intensive system. And so what happened in the U.S. was that U.S. farmers got into deeper and deeper debt to the, to the extent that now U.S. farmers carry $426 billion in debt. I think in New Zealand, it's something around $60 billion in debt. So you've got to start there. So completely agree with the metrics and the standards and everything that, that Jeff just presented. But if it doesn't make financial sense to the farmer, they can't embrace it because they're already under such record debt levels because of this addiction to the chemical system that most farmers have been implementing for a long time. And it's not to shame that, it's to simply step into it and say, economically, financially, does this make sense? Are you, are you kind of, you're addicted into this model. So how do we actually break that chemical addiction? And I think that's where regenerative ag is a first, is a starting point, is, is so brilliant. And there's so many farmers that are sort of coming in, sitting down at the table and they've been, they've been growing chemically intensive agricultural systems for the last 20, 30 years, you know? So they're not, they're not anybody that's sort of at the front of this movement. And I think that's really important to, to emphasize. They come in because they know financially their business model is not in a strong enough place for their own children to want to step into it and take it over. And so then what happens to the farm? Then what happens to New Zealand's farm economy when that starts to happen? And so for us, you know, really, it's really important to think about how do you actually make this financially resilient for the farmers? And, you know, that I think, unfortunately, with a lot of the larger banking entities hasn't always been the case. And so to think about regenerative agriculture, you have to think about regenerative capital. And we've seen systems start to shift where you've had a fossil fuel system and all of a sudden people shift and they go to solar or wind energy. And you have a system like conventional agriculture and people start to shift where they go to regenerative organic agriculture. It's the same thing with finance. You have a toxic financial system and people need to shift. And what's interesting is that there's a transition happening with generational wealth where $22 trillion in the United States is changing hands into this younger generation. And the younger generation, you don't have to convince them of this. They understand exactly what's happening with climate, environment, with some of these bigger entities that have really kind of corrupted and consolidated certain systems. And so they're actually looking for places to put capital. We believe that regenerative capital as a system needs to exist and be built out. And you know, we're starting here in the US, but it is an open invitation. And we've had incredible collaboration with groups in New Zealand as well. There's so many people coming around the table who recognize that this is absolutely in the best interest of New Zealand's farm economy. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and certainly we've, um, we've been trying to take a systems perspective as we are in these, in these conversations and seeing what are all the moving parts. Um, there are certainly some you know, farmers that I've been talking with as part of the research for this series who are organic but not regenerative, and then others who are employing regenerative methods on their farm but um, are not completely organic yet. So I'd love to ask you, Scott, what do you see as some of the, the low-hanging fruits in New Zealand for the... Uh, for those who are in organics in New Zealand um, to become more regenerative in their practices if, if they're not already? Good question there, Elena. The, um, I think it's just all about the, the system, a systems approach rather than a product replacement approach. And I think it's very much about the soil, the soil, the soil. And I have this old mantra that I harp on about, and it sounds like I'm preaching, but I say healthy soil for healthy people, for healthy food, sorry, soils for healthy food, for healthy people, healthy society, and, that, and it goes around. So I, I think the, um, where we can just harp back to is really just pick up on that point. Um, sorry, I just lost my notes and what I'm looking at there is, um, to be it's it's all about the awareness really i think that's the lowest hanging fruit that we could grab and all the information is often out there it's just about being aware of what we need and and reading up and getting getting into that whole um certified organics can i think we've dropped the ball on picking up regen and i think we need to be aware that uh good organic practices are regenerative and should be and we need to encourage more of that and we we without um being too cynical of some organic farmers, they may not be doing as good a job as they could be in their, in their approach to things is really what I'd suggest. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, there's an interesting uh, question come through in the, in the chat window from Deborah Crow, um, which is, uh, how do we best engage with balance or, or Ravensdown or any other, other key farming influences? Do, do they have a role to play in this, do you think? Or, um, or is that perhaps uh, being naive to think that they're going to encourage people to go organic? <laughs> Scott, have you got any, sorry, any thoughts sorry, on that just, in New Zealand? Sorry, I had to mute my microphone there. I, I see, and, and for Jeff and Robin, Ravensdown is one of uh, two or three large fertiliser cooperatives, which, which we often as fertiliser users and, and growers, we, we buy into this co-op and we get given a, a rebate credit on the amount of tonnes of fertiliser we buy, not the dollars of fertiliser. So, um, at Ravensdown were certified organic many years ago, and our other large co-op balance agronutrients, they're actually certified organic, and they're an important input supplier to our certified organic production system in New Zealand. And, and we, we would be somewhat lost without them. We, we utilize them for many of the macro and the micronutrients that we need to feed and to produce a healthy soil because Many of our soils are naturally deficient in certain items and we need to purchase those from sustainable sources, use them wisely and, and use them to build our soil fertility. So um, it's part of our regenerative process is definitely including the ravens down, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I guess the, the, the question was coming about from how cynical do we think they're going to be in supporting our future towards more of a regenerative approach? Well. I think they need to step up and, and get on board and be part of the discussion, be part of it and part of the transition from getting off the chemical bandwagon and the reliance upon um, many, many artificial and often detrimental ingredients to our natural food production systems. Mm. Well, thank I, you. you know, I, can, I, can, I can speak to that from what we've seen in the US too. I think, um, you know, this transition from conventional chemically intensive agriculture to regenerative and organic, um, it, requires, it requires technical expertise. And so what we're seeing is that companies or organizations or people who were once in the fertilizer business, and I mean, we've been, we've been through the same transition here in the US, they were in the business of selling these inputs. All of a sudden recognize that there's a technical expertise that's required in that transition. So you, got, you go from a model of actually selling inputs to a model of selling services. So all of a sudden there's a consulting service that's being sold in the technical assistance partner. And I mean, again, as a, as a regenerative ag investment partner, that's not us, but we partner with different technical expertise around the country, you know, that are working wheat or barley or whatever it may be. But I think it's that same opportunity here. And you'd be surprised because, you know, from those big fertilizer companies, we call them the alumni, people that have been in those big places for 20 or 30 years, and they start to spin out. And those alumni actually have a lot of, a lot of insight, and a lot of expertise of how to work with a farmer. And you just transition a little bit. So instead of selling those inputs, you're talking about cover crops. And instead of selling certain equipment, there's different equipment that's need for regenerative organic agriculture. So it's really thinking about it again. You, again, you, I mean, policy is gonna follow the money. So you've got to think about what is the financial model here that's accompanying this transition that benefits the farmers of New Zealand. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing those learnings, um, Robin. Um, I wanna flip that question now, because I've talked to a, quite a few um, farmers that are regenerative on their land and they, they want to continue um, practices like no-till but are finding themselves needing to, to spray occasionally um, and, use, and use small amounts of synthetic inputs. So um, do, do you see there being any, um, obviously it is a continuum, but do you see that as um, something that can gradually move? It's, it's an interesting question, particularly in the, um, the wake of the buyer settlement last week, the $10 billion um, settlement um, for the, um, the uh, connection between Roundup and, and cancer. So that's, um, that's obviously been making a lot of headlines um, and is getting people to think about the use of glyphosate. Um, is, is there any opportunity or room for using just, just small amounts or do you think we need to be able to go fully organic regenerative to really take advantage of the market opportunities? Robin, what do you think? 
I'm going to throw this one to Jeff because regenerative organic certification speaks to a phased approach, which I think makes it accessible to everybody. And I think what you want here is 100% participation. So you don't want to feel like anybody's being screened out. So Jeff, I'm going to turn this in, this to you. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Robin. Um, so I think there's two ways of looking at this. You know, if you're looking at it purely from a certification perspective, then no, there's absolutely no place for synthetic uh, fertilizers or pesticides in, in a certified organic system or a certified regenerative organic system. And Rodale, and now I'm going to speak purely from the science. So the second part of my answer is that Rodale Institute sits on over 40 years of science that would prove that organic agricultural practices or regenerative agricultural practice, regenerative organic practices um, can actually out yield and outperform conventional chemical systems um, in, by up to three to six times, especially in years of extreme rain or droughts. Um, so there's plenty of science that would suggest that we can farm just fine without those chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. However, um, going back to our earlier point, we're going to meet a farmer wherever they are and help them along the path and, and help them move away from those dependencies. I guess the question I would put back to the, to the agrochemical industry is, you know, just as we're all sitting here talking about innovation through this, this phased approach, uh, at the end of the day, regenerative organic is about innovation. You know, my question is, is how are those agrochemical companies going to innovate to more safer inputs? Um, we clearly are seeing in news headlines that the kind of chemicals that our farmers are depending on are making people sick. They're polluting our environments, our waterways, and our air. Um, we have to put, a, we have to, we all have, to, we have a responsibility to play in this. And I think the product innovation pipelines, um, as, as I, as I see it, really don't um, have a lot in play that would actually begin to move in a more environmentally sound direction. So I think we have to challenge our industries in the same way we've challenged the food industry and consumers have created demand for healthier, more nourishing and certified organic food. And our food companies have responded beautifully. And the organic food industry in the United States is now $50 billion and I believe it's a $100 billion industry worldwide. Why are we not putting those same pressures on our agrochemical companies to make products that are safer? Um, and so I don't think they're off the hook. And I, you know, I think if you were to look deeply at the news of what happened with the settlement this past week with Bayer, um, I'm certainly no lit litigation expert, but it would seem to me that someone in our world felt that it would be extremely detrimental to our economic well-being to completely put a company like that out of business. They're, they're trying to work with this company. They're trying to create a settlement. Um, and so I think we all have a responsibility to play and I think we need to put pressures on these companies to to make better and better decisions for the health of yeah, us. Yeah, I would I, I would echo that and also say, you know, we, we're talking a lot about farmers here, clearly with policy, the work that Scott's doing and Chris Morrison and the board. Um, but the corporations play a really important role and I think it's really important for the corporations to understand this isn't an either or scenario. You don't have to do one or the other. Hedge your portfolio. From Terra Dairy, for example, begin to think about what it would look like to have regenerative dairy farms in that portfolio. The best example globally for that is Danone. I mean, Danone was not anywhere near any of this 10 years ago. And yet, as they embrace the B Corp certification, they began to transition their portfolio. It's been fascinating to watch what that company has learned over the last 10 years. So, you know, again, it's embrace this transition. And, and it doesn't have to be an either or situation. You're able to sort of build out your portfolio with both and. Yes, absolutely. Um, and going back to Jeff's um, comments, we do have the added complication in, um, in New Zealand that we are sourcing our phosphate or a great deal of it from Western Sahara. And we're one of, I think we might be the only Western country who's, who's still importing um, phosphate from that, that occupied territory, which has um, uh, resulted in the displacement of a number of people. Um, I would like to hear um, from you, Scott, um, a little bit about your thoughts of the organic spill um, going through Parliament at the moment. What, what will that mean in terms of certainty uh, for the sector and certainty for the consumer? Good question, Lena. As I mentioned before, we've, we've been on this crusade for uh, more than 10 years, and it's not very often that we who complain about too much regulation, et cetera, as primary producers have actually gone to the government and said, hey, give us some teeth. Give us some regulation. Um, we appreciate there might be some more paperwork, hopefully not too much more cost if it's done well. 
but please um, give us give us some teeth so our, our markets and our consumers can actually identify and verify what the word organic means to them. Um, we've had a quasi system in place where um, MPI have been able to use the BioGrow and the Assure Quality New Zealand standards for our exports and uh, rubber stamped that, that system in place. But still we see a lot of um, times when we need the word certified organic or the word organic even verified to give some people some teeth. And, and this has been a big process of many, many years, lots of hard work. It's, it's cross-party political situation now. Um, we're into the second um, hearing of the reading at the moment. And um, to be fair, it hasn't played out as well as we in the organic industry had hoped. We were, we were asking our Ministry of Primary Industries to support what we had asked for and, and rub stamp and take on board the BioGrow and Assure Quality Certification, also the Demeter, the Biodynamic Certification. And we've, um, we're at a stage now, we've had a little bit of return and, and feedback from the, from the government that's gonna be somewhat different than that. So we're just working our way tentatively through that process. Mm. Um, Scott, while we're on you, I'd like to put a question to you from Sean Peel, who's um, a kiwi fruit supplier to Zespri. Um, how can the horticultural systems go regenerative in New Zealand when there's um, the, the global gap system doesn't permit stock and compost inputs from fear of E. coli contamination? So that's quite a tricky one for horticulturalists in New Zealand um, that that can't use those those particular form of regenerative methods uh, due to the, the fears around that. Is that potentially a regulation that we need to look at? I think it's a very good question from Sean, and there's. Um, just to verify, we have the, the GAP, the Good Agricultural Practice Systems in New Zealand, and we have the Global Gap, which we use for export around the world, and we have the NZ Gap. And our main retailers in New Zealand, you have to be certified at least to the minimum of NZ Gap to actually supply the supermarkets. I think we're coming to a stage where it's fear of brand and image and damage, etc., and it's, it's reducing some of our good natural processes in place, which is involving livestock, et cetera, in the system. And um, just like um, we're seeing with the COVID pandemic around the world as well too, there, there's fears and, and um, we are now seeing some retailers say to yourself, be really careful with what you're doing with your food supply, remove your animals from this, et cetera. I don't think that's actually right. I think we need to be involving animals in our regenerative process, although there's practicalities and there's risks involved in that. If you minimize the risk and, and manage those practicalities, I think it can be done well. And I think um, all these rules and regulations and systems, we as producers have to be involved in them and provide some feedback to them. So um, I don't see, for instance, in, in Sean's situation with kiwi fruit. I don't see there being a risk with having animals in a, in a kiwi fruit situation where the fruit's two meters off the ground and you've got great UV light, et cetera. I do see a high risk if I was uh, putting raw animal manures onto salad crop production or something like that, which is one step closer to the food chain. So under a certified organic regime, these, these are taken into account and you have to be really, really careful in what you do with that. And I think the global gap and, or any gap standard will evolve over time to help find that balance between the risk and the benefits of animals in our system. Um, I've been involved with that many times where we took animals out of our vegetable production systems because an electric hot wire would not hold a group of cows sometimes and keep them out of your onion field. So there was a practicality. We, we were six months off selling those onions, so there wasn't a risk for many uh, contamination from and the manure side of it, but the practicalities of it were uh, the economic damage of the cattle standing in your onion field was horrendous. So um, in mixed farming operations, we need to find this balance. Mm, interesting points. And um, yeah, I'd, li I'd like to actually riff off that in terms of a, a post-COVID situation that we're looking at. Um, Jeff, interested to know what, um, what Rodale is, is um, What's your position in this post-pandemic world? Is there an opportunity to be um, engaging more people on, on rethinking the connection between how we produce and consume food? 100%, absolutely. You know, 
uh, Scott, I think you alluded to this earlier, but our founder, J.I. Rodale, he, he actually came forward with a mission statement back in 1942, where he said that healthy soil equals healthy food equals healthy people. So that's the mission statement that guides our work. And I think it's true now more than ever that we, as, con we, as consumers, we're waking up to the fact that um, our health is absolutely dependent upon the health of the soil, where our food comes from, how it's produced. And so all of a sudden, we see this global pandemic hit in the month of March. And here in the United States, we're seeing um, growth in the organic sector of, uh, I think it was 20% in the month of March and 18% in the month of April. Um, direct farm sales are at an all-time high. We're seeing consumers that are trying to make connections with farmers in their own community. Um, I spoke to a farmer last month here in my community who said his, his direct sales were up 400% year over year. So I think that there's this mass awakening uh, where consumers are really uh, realizing that in order to take control of their own health, it's going to have to be up to them. And I think people are wanting to connect with source. We're actually seeing uh, gardening seed sales spike. So people all of a sudden retreated to their backyards this spring here in the States and are planting gardens. So there's this real hunger, this real yearning to reconnect with nature, with reconnect with our, with our personal health. And I think that a global pandemic can, has, ex, has expedited a shift towards healthier lifestyle and towards healthier relationship with the soil and with, with our farmers, ultimately. I think we've also seen a massive disruption in supply chains. And so all of a sudden, when we go to the grocery store and there isn't food on the shelves, then consumers recognize that there's a flawed system and that we need to, we need to change that. And so I'm very, not only myself, but I think I speak for our, ent our entire organization, that I'm very hopeful. And I see a lot of positive change in individual people as a result of this very scary time that we're living in. Mm, it's good to hear that you're hopeful. Um, I want to ask a question to Robin on the, on the topic of proving the economic cases of, as you've discussed. Um, Rodale's 30-year uh, trial, and I think it might even be a 40-year trial, you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Jeff, but um, it's got fantastic evidence supporting the economic case for mixed cropping enterprises. Um, can either of you share any examples of something similar or similar longitudinal studies that have looked at the dairy or red meat enterprises? Jeff, you want to take that one? Sure, and I'm actually going to put a link to the study where if anyone is interested in reading more about it, it's called the Farming Systems Trial. It is a 40-year study uh, that's looking at cropping systems. Um, I also put a link just above that to an integrated crop and livestock study that started about four or five years ago that would speak a little bit to uh, the question posed to Scott a few moments ago. But essentially what the Farming Systems Trial is comparing are conventional grain systems that you would see at pretty much anywhere in the world, mostly corn and soy, but also weaving in wheat and oats into the rotation. And those, those plots are grown using chemically intensive high, high tillage methodologies. And those are uh, grown directly next to plots that are grown in a more regenerative organic manner using cover crops and heavier crop rotations. Um, and in some cases, uh, sort of getting nitrogen from natural, naturally occurring sources. And over that 40 year study, uh, I mentioned earlier that we've proven that out, that organic systems can out yield conventional systems. They're about comparable um, over that 40 year period, except for when we see these extreme weather events, either drought or rain, we can see upwards of three to six times uh, greater yields in the, in the organic systems. But here's where it gets really interesting. Um, we're actually using about 45% less energy in the organic systems. Um, we're, we're storing water at much deeper depth. So when we, when, we, when we look down through a lysimeter, we can see that we're capturing water um, using less energy. We're emitting less carbon into the atmosphere, but the greatest statistic is that we're producing up to three times more profits in the organic systems. So the organic systems are three times more profitable. And to me, that, that ultimately is what move, you know, convinces markets that this is a real viable system. One last thing I'll say is that this farming systems trial, though it's been run at Rodale Institute for over 40 years, it has been replicated here in the United States at five other locations where uh, there's five other university partners that have created their own studies. Not, they haven't run as long, but when you look at the data coming out of those other five studies, it's very, very comparable to what we're seeing at Rodale Institute. So it's quite convincing that we, we can yeah. do this. 
The other thing I will add is if you think of the farm system that we've embraced globally over the last 50 years, it involved layering in a lot of middlemen. And I think what COVID exposed was how that actually created the crisis by not having that direct relationship to the farmer between the consumer and the farmer. So by, by removing the middlemen, you're actually making a, a smarter financial system that goes along with the farming system. And so I think that was one of the silver linings of COVID. And like Jeff touched on, the statistics that we were getting from farmers that had even a very basic e-commerce shopping site on their, on their site, a shopping cart, they were telling us that within a couple of weeks, they had done as much in revenue online as they had done in all of 2019. And the consumers were hungry for that direct relationship to the grower. And then on top of that, you know, it's really important to remind viewers that we're not, we're not talking about going back. Today, we actually have 21st century technology and innovation in our hands that actually help facilitate this transition in ways that farmers 50 years ago didn't have. And that whole space of ag tech is a fascinating space with being able to use technology to really deploy on farm when you're talking about water conservation, soil organic matter, carbon sequestration. And we have the technology now that enables us to capture these metrics that we didn't have even 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. So to think about leveraging 21st century technology, the data that it provides on farm, you know, with any farmer that's got their handheld phone and leveraging that as we consider making and financing these transitions. Right, thank you. Um, I want to bring it back briefly to the, those definitions of regenerative and organic, um, because there's a, there's a question in the chat window from, from Jenny coming back to the, the glyphosate issue. And um, it, it, is it sort of disingenuous in a, in a co opting of the, of the term regenerative um, for a, or a farmer who is still using some synthetic inputs to be using that term? Um, there are certainly a lot, a lot of people that, as you said, are on, on the on the continuum, and we don't want to be exclusive. Um, but, but is there a? Do you see it problematic as as people using that word regenerative um, when when they're putting something on the soil that inherently isn't regenerative, and is killing soil biology? Were you posing that question? Are you posing that question to me? Um, if you feel called to answer it, let's go with you. Yeah, sure. yeah, for sure. Uh, my answer is certainly not the end all be all, but um, to Jenny Lux's point in the chat, um, yeah, farmers here in the United States are and were co-opting that word regenerative, at least from Rodale's vantage point, which is why we launched an actual certification combining the words regenerative and organic. Um, we, you know, Rodale Institute was very instrumental along with other, other leaders uh, in launching the organic certification 20 and 30 years ago, and we worked really hard to create legislation and to get the federal government behind that word. And it took a lot of work. Um, and we did that to safeguard that word. Um, yes, Rodale coined the term organic, but we actually gave it over to the United States Department of Agriculture to house that standard. And um, it ended up you know, being the right thing to do. And here we, we wanted to avoid this, any potential chance of the same thing happening to regenerative, that that word would become would ultimately meaning everything and nothing. We wanted to really put some definition to it. And so we have launched an actual standard, but however, I, I think it is, and, and Rodale is also having conversations with some of the people here on this call about what the standard might look like in New Zealand. And that's very exciting because you guys have an opportunity to get it right, right out of the gate. And, um, and I think you have really smart people working on it, but um, I don't, you know, I don't, I, th I think as long as these three words are defined, so regenerative, organic and regenerative organic, then I think it helps the consumer ultimately understand what they're supporting and, uh, and also potentially gives a farmer that's embracing any one of those practices an, an economic incentive. So I think as long as those words are defined and clearly um, identified by the consumer and you're helping the consumer make a more informed decision, then I think it's okay. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, th those definitions, I think, are important. We've had, we've had a lot of conversations around the de definitions of regenerative in previous webinars. And it's, uh, it's something that's uh, debated a fair amount. Uh, but if we're talking certifications, those are going to be absolutely necessary. Are there any other key learnings do you think New Zealand could pick up from, um, from the US in, in terms of adopting a regenerative organic standard and that, that higher level? of certification, uh, Jeff or Robin? Well, I think you have that. I think you have the opportunity to learn from some tremendous mistakes that we've made here. 
um, you know, with complete respect for the work of Rodale Institute and the other organizations that were around the table defining the organic standard for us um, in the 1990s. Unfortunately, it wasn't rigorous enough. And so what ended up happening was as these larger corporations came into play, they realized that they had the opportunity to um, water it down or dilute it in some way. And unfortunately, that's what's happened. And so the struggle we have in the US is that all of a sudden along comes regenerative and the consumer who is paying that premium for organic products thinks that the definition of regenerative is already integrated into those terms. She thinks that soil health, of course, would be part of an organic standard. So that's where you have all of a sudden this conflict. And I think the worst part about it is that it, that it puts the farmers at odds. And it is so important to bring the farmers together. You've got to think about it as one farm economy, you know, and of course, they're not all growing the same crops. They're not all going to grow the same way. And to have that grace and flexibility, I think, is incredibly important. So to learn from that mistake, I think, you know, New Zealand is sort of a late adopter to this organic standard globally. And um, it's surprising, really, because it's just, it's such a forward thinking country when it comes to agriculture and just with the capacity for what it can do. And so to really to really process and digest these different mistakes and to really think about how do we make sure that this organic certification includes that definition of regenerative so that it makes sense to the consumer, so that the corporation has an easy time explaining it. So you've got to just think about it, like how can you translate this at a 10 year old level? Like how can we communicate this at a 10 year old level? It's got to be that easy and that straightforward. And I think the beauty of when you're talking about soil health, it's pretty straightforward and there is absolutely nothing here in the United States that gets bipartisan support anymore. And yet when legislation was introduced for soil health, it immediately got bipartisan support. So what is in the best interest for soil health for New Zealand? It is regenerative organic agriculture. Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of um, a belief in New Zealand that, that what we do here in conventional farming is already regenerative and and um, I don't know if that's perhaps a reason why we've been so slow to uh, adopt an organic standard as we have this story that we're leading the world in so many in so many ways. Um, Jeff did you want to have anything to add to that otherwise I'd like to um, talk a little bit about the, the consumer side of things. I don't, I don't think there's anything more that I could add to what Robin said I think she was spot on. Okay wonderful. Um, Scott looks like Scott wants to say something else. Yeah, Scott. I'd just like to add something in there, and I think both uh, Robin and Jeff both touched on it. We, we as and people who are involved in the organic industry, we or consumers, producers, we have a philosophy that we wish to see the greening of conventional agriculture. And there's people along that continuum at all different stages. We'll have some of our good friends who are conventional farmers who are looking across the fence, looking at making some change, looking at reducing reliance on glyphosate, those sorts of things. Because it's really, it goes back to the previous question, is you'd have to be a pretty slow farmer not to look at what's happening around the world and say, hey, there's something happening. We're not going to be reliant on glyphosate in the future. We have to reduce our reliance on these. The world's changing. Our consumers are driving more of the decisions that we make on farm, et cetera. So I think we have to help our conventional farmers come along the way. We don't want to exclude anybody, as Robin alluded to. Um, everybody's at a different stage in their life towards what is good soil health and good food for them and what's good for their business. And um, I'm rather pragmatic across to say, we shouldn't just turn the tap off with these chemicals that people are used to at the moment. We need to show the conventional farmers that they can reduce their reliance while still making money out of what they're doing. And I think that's what we can learn from the US. Um, and the mistakes we don't want to learn from the US is uh, not to regulate these words. I mean, New Zealand's done a really poor job of regulating kiwi fruit in the past and, and many other things as well too. And, and, um, we're getting the America's cut back. We're going to keep that again next year as well in our sailing as well. So there's some things we've done really well and some things we've done poorly. We've got a chance now to actually uh, retain the word organic and give it some teeth and bring in regenerative agricultural guidelines into our organic standard. And I hope we can do that without annoying or turning off any of the people who are that along their way or who don't even know they're yet going to be heading that way in 10 years or 20 years time. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an issue for us in New Zealand that we often think that we're green already because we live in the wide open spaces, we have good rainfall, good climate. Um, 
we it's what it, we actually should be thinking is actually it's one step easier for many farmers to be able to take that step to regen organic. Um, they may choose to stop at regen, and that's okay as long as Jeff said it's defined in the words, and, and and we can have that understanding. Although I do get concerned that a consumer is often bombarded with so many different messages, and we have to be clear and concise in those messages. Yes, and that's uh, that's something I think I hope we'll um, we'll see a little bit of clarity around with this bill coming through Parliament. Um, curious to know from uh, perhaps you, Robin. Uh, around costs that might be passed on to the consumer with this with this new standard. So, um, have you found that regenerative organic products um, are more expensive than current organic products in the U.S.? It, this gets back to an earlier statement. So, you've got to think about capital as the first product, the first ingredient in the food system. So, the way that these loans have been structured have been with a complete lack of understanding of what it takes a farmer to transition to regenerative or organic. You know, if you were to sit down with any of these big banks, I mean, very few would be able to tell you, walk you through what exactly has to happen to transition a farmer from conventional ag to regenerative or organic. So you actually have to start there. And when you think about the loan terms, that the extractive loan terms that have been put in place on so many of these farmers, the banks are, the banks are happy with it. You know, they've just got these huge debt levels. Um, they're just managing that debt. You know, they're all the interest and everything else they're earning off the, the farmer debt. I mean, they, they don't really have any incentive to change that system. You know, they want to keep the farmer in that pocket. Um, I mean, it's just brutal to say it that, that straightforward. But, you know, unfortunately, we have a broken food system because of the financial system that has financed this. So you have to step back and say, what would it look like if you actually created a loan to the farmer that was tied to soil health? So at Replant, we thought, you know, what would it look like if the terms of the loan were actually tied to carbon sequestration, soil organic matter, and water conservation. I mean, farmers that are farming regeneratively are doing this stuff anyway, but they're not compensated for it. So you get a lower cost of capital because you've implemented these smarter practices. And once you start to do that, you're changing that entire equation when you're talking about costs. So, you know, the other thing I think that's really important to emphasize is there's enormous job opportunities around this right now. There are innovation industries that need to be built to support this transition. We're talking, you know, replant for one is like, let's build out a financial services industry around this space of regenerative ag investment partners. We want many partners at the table. The second piece is clearly the technical assistance partners. They need to be at the table. You think about crop insurance. I mean, that's just in, in cover crops. I mean, there's so many places to intersect and create these models. And then I think lastly, you know, glyphosate and what we've seen with bear is a perfect example, the liability of sticking with the status quo is huge. And it's because the consumer is so much more well-informed than we were 20 years ago. And it's because every single person has one of these. So we can pull this up at any time and we're able to figure out what exactly is going on on the farm. And what's fascinating is that companies are coming out all the time where they're inventing different technologies and platforms where you can use your phone to figure out what's going on in your food. So the more transparency that's coming at the consumer, for the food, the more the food companies actually have to be in front of this. And that means they have to be in conversations with their farmers now. So, you know, I think it's not an apples and oranges thing. We, we are talking about changing that entire equation. Yeah, I think there's a long way for the, the financing uh, sector in New Zealand to be starting to think about, about these movements. We've got just a few minutes left. So I want to give each panelist just one minute uh, to add any final thoughts that you haven't been able to bring to the table so far. Uh, let's start with you, Scott. Well, I'd just like to pick up on that point about the capital. And New Zealand was lucky enough to have Prometheus Finance, ethical investments, etc. And, and I think it struggled to gain traction because it didn't necessarily have those metrics in place that you could assess and, and then benefit the farmer and then say, hey, well done, where, where are we heading to now? We, we have a carbon trading platform in New Zealand, but not on soil carbon. Um, and that may be something that we wish to see evolve. There's a lot of work going on in soil carbon. Um, I'm hoping that this, the basic metric of organic matter and then what percentage of organic matter is actually soil carbon and then what percentage of that can actually end up as humus, because we keep forgetting this whole thing about humus. Humus is where we need to be getting to, not just the simple soil carbon stage. So that's something that I encourage everybody to look at. Yeah, thank you. The soil carbon markets will certainly be an interesting one to explore in the future. Um, and we did, we did have a panelist last week, Mike um, Taitoko from Toha, who's also looking to bridge that, um, that gap in, um, 
investment as well. Uh, Jeff, any thoughts from you? Final thoughts? Yeah, I'd like to just build on um, a comment Robin, Robin made a few moments ago, but you know, currently we're externalizing the price of food. So consumers aren't paying the real price for real food. Uh, they're paying for it uh, on the other end. Uh, here in the United States, we're seeing an explosion in healthcare at, in a, at unsustainable and unprecedented rates. I think we're paying like 3.2 trillion in healthcare uh, on an annual basis. It's like 17% of our GDP. And that trend just continues. And so, um, yes, we've asked our farmers to produce cheap food and they've delivered that um, over, the, over the last few decades. And um, we now need to pay for it on the front end instead of the back end. We need to re-pattern consumer behavior and help consumers to understand that food, that there's a, there is a value in what farmers are producing. We need to value Scott's crops and the way in which he's producing food. He's setting a higher bar. And when we purchase food from him, we're doing ourselves a service and we're doing our environment a service. And we need, we need education to help consumers understand that. So I think there's, there's work to do around empowering consumers to make better decisions, but also helping them to realize that, yes, we might have to make some other sacrifices in other areas of our life in order to pay the real price for real food. But we all win in the end. It's a better world if we're buying food according to how it was produced. Thank you, Jeff. That's a super important point about the externalization of, of costs. Uh, Robin, over to you for any last thoughts. Yeah, I will, I'll add to that. It was last June. I was in the Beehive, actually. We were looking out the window and um, someone was telling me about the National Cancer Center that was going to be built in Wellington. And as I was meeting with different people there, you know, we had the conversation, you can either pay the doctor to make you better once you've already gotten sick, or you can pay the farmer to keep you healthy. And I think New Zealand right now has this opportunity to really work with the farmer, to build that financial resiliency, to build a healthy farm economy for New Zealand and build a healthy New Zealand. And we didn't do that in the US. In the US, one in two men are expected to get cancer and one in three women. Cancer is now the leading cause of death by disease in children under the age of 15 in the United States. And that's where it's like, I don't want this to happen. I don't want this to come to New Zealand. So you're at this incredibly important place, this incredibly important inflection where you have the opportunity to really invest in your farm economy that builds a health resiliency as well. And I think that's the opportunity in front of New Zealand. And then I also think it's just so incredibly exciting because there's so much opportunity for innovation. The younger generation of farmers that's coming up underneath the way that they can leverage technology, they have ideas that the older generations haven't had. And so really to invite that just incredible collaboration that's required for this, is what actually makes it fun and it's actually gonna be what makes it successful. Oh, those are some sobering statistics. Um, thank you, Robin. And thank you, everybody, for joining us today, to all of our panelists. Um, it's been a fantastic session. Um, thank you to everybody for joining us. Our next session next week is uh, going to be on building farm resilience. Um, and we will be uh, speaking with Gary Williams, who's a, a long time uh, thought leader and permaculturalist um, and organic farmer and regenerative farmer here in New Zealand. Um, and also with Greg Hart, who is um, a co-owner of Mangarara Station, the family farm in the Hawke's Bay. Um, and of course the Hawke's Bay have, and a lot of parts of New Zealand have had um, a brutal drought this summer here in New Zealand. So I think it's gonna be a really exciting conversation around building resilience, um, not just to environmental factors, but to economic factors as well. Um, same time next week, uh, 12 p.m. And we've got a bunch of other webinars coming up. Uh, I believe Ursula is going to put the registration link for the next one in the chat window if you want to check that out. Otherwise, please check out the Pure Advantage website and the Edmund Hillary Fellowship website for details on the upcoming uh, webinars on regenerative forestry, tourism, urban agriculture. We've got some super exciting speakers, um, including Dame Anne Salmon, Salmond in a couple of weeks' time. And um, a lot, of, a lot of things still to explore in this series. Um, do check out the social media. We've been broadcasting this on Facebook as well as recording it today, so you'll be able to access it. Um, so Pure Advantage will be... Um, 
continuing this conversation on their social media and perhaps trying to get some of these questions that we didn't get answered today. Sorry, we didn't get to go with all of them. Um, just so much <laughs> excitement around this topic. So really good to see all those questions coming through. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we will catch you again next week. Thanks again to all our panelists. Bye-bye. Ka kite. <laughs>